must be our goal and our guide. And all that we strive for as a human family, dignity and hope, progress and prosperity, depends on peace. But peace depends on us. Africa, good morning, the world, wherever you are in the world, thank you very much for watching Punchline Africa Television. This is the only television in the world, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that talks about Africa. What ails Africa? What kills Africa? Where are we? Why are we the continent with perennial conflicts? Why are our people abusing human rights? Why are people being killed? Why is there Boko Haram? Why is there Al Shabaab? Why is there a war in northern Mozambique? Today, from Cairo to Cape Town, Dar es Salaam to Lagos, Lagos to Abuja, Abuja to Port Harcourt, Gabon. Today, from Maputo to Rwanda, Kinshasa. Akura, Tripoli. What is happening in Tripoli makes Africa look a very bad continent. My show this morning is a simple show. I'm going to see what we can do for Africa. I have stood firm for the last five years. I've stood firm on this television station, stood by the people of Biafra. I am not going to be intimidated, but I will ask the questions that are supposed to be asked. General Buhari has not answered my questions for the last five good years. I have sent messages for them to answer why people in that great nation of Africa with a population of 220 million people. Why are people dying? Why are human rights abuses taking place? Why are tribes, the flan killing the Igbo? Christians killing, uh, being killed by Islamists. Boko Haram taking people killing people day and the night. Abducting young girls who should be in school. I want General Buhari. I am also a general. I left the army with a rank lower than yours. But in the rank of a brigadier general by rebel activities that I've conducted worldwide to struggle the struggle for my country. We shook hands and we left. But I want to ask a question. Why have you left Nigeria to collapse an economic big hub for the people of Africa? We look at you with the huge population and you are there as a president claiming to be a president. That you have no moral authority. You promised people 
in your first term, General Buhari, that you will finish Boko Haram in 100 days. Are you part of Boko Haram? These are the questions that I want to put across our television station wants people to understand why Nigeria is collapsing. Why Nigeria is disintegrating. Is there a state called Nigeria anymore? Because I don't see it. It has fallen to bandits, hostage takers, kidnappers, Boko Haram, people coming, corruption, people coming in the south is killing people. The people of Onita, I have a friend in Onita who always documents everything. And by the way, Buhari, I'm also an international lawyer. I'm waiting for Fatou Besuda to leave the scene. If they have spared you there, I'm going to take you there. I have a right as a citizen, as a member of the United Nations, as a member of International Criminal Court, my country has signed a signatory to ICC. I'll deliver you there. It doesn't need a Nigerian to deliver you in the ICC. So take notes on this show and understand we are not joking. You might joke with Nigerians whom you cut their limbs off every day. But some of us are going to take serious international channels to make sure that you land in whether you wait as a president today or a former president. You will be answerable to the atrocities that you have committed against the people of Nigeria and the Biafran people. Thank you very much. My guest today in the studio whom I'm interviewing. This is the general headquarters of Punchline Africa Television. We want to take the opportunity to thank the government of Republic of Kenya, the East African community, the African continent, for listening to our plea giving us the freedom to discuss issues that destroy Africa. We have no regrets for stating statements truthfully what is going on in Africa? The truth is that there is no Nigeria anymore. And if Africans are waiting for Nigeria and they go to AU and say, We have Nigeria, we have Buhari, maybe we have Buhari 6.1 feet, but we don't have Nigeria. I have no good words. His Excellency, President Buhari, has to pull up his socks. We are crying for the Nigerians, for the state of Nigeria. It is collapsing. The killings, the murder, the rape, the defilement, the destruction of property, the slaughter of youth because of one thing they ask for, freedom to express themselves is what makes me very upset. But let me cool down. And I come to my guest. My guest today is Mr. Mazi Namudu Kanu, the leader of indigenous people of Biafra. Welcome to the show, Mr. Namudu Kanu. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for having me on your wonderful program today. It's, a, it's an honor I've been looking forward to for a very long time. For, for very many years we've been watching you, and I'm glad to be here today. Thank you very much. Today we are honored, and we want to start off by giving you a chance for us to know you. Because many of my people in Kenya, and as you are aware, Kenya is a member, is the chairperson of Africa Peace Security Council. The, the authorities in this country, Kenya, are watching. They want to know the difficulties that you have. Two, Kenya also has a lot of Nigerian refugees who have come to Kenya to apply for asylum, especially from the southeast. 
of the Biafran area. They are here. And we should not keep quiet and tell lies. There are many here. They want to know in East Africa, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Zimbabwe. I've found very many of them. Zimbabwe has given them a lot of asylum. We want to know you. Who are you, sir? I am Mazen the Colonel, the leader of the Indigenous School of Biafra, IPOB. I represent every aspiration and hope that over 70 million people harbor all over the world. Our job is to restore Biafra in peace and not in pieces by seeking a very simple route via a UN supervised referendum or place beside as the case may be. We are here to restore our land to the way it was before the white man came. What we are doing is nothing against Nigeria per se. What we are trying to say is Nigeria as presently constituted is not working and we are doing all we can to try to raise the levels of human development of our understanding, education, health sector, the economy and all the rest of it. If we continue to remain in Nigeria, not just are we going to suffer, but the whole continent of Africa is going to suffer as a result, as a consequence of the ineptitude, the corruption, the backwardness, the retrogressive mindset of the people who are presently in charge of that very place. Initially, most people tend to see us as not being Pan-African enough. I am a Pan-Africanist. I believe in the unity of the African state. My preference will be for Africa to have one nation, one government, one people, even one language if that is possible. I am a subscriber to the very fine influence of Kiswahili amongst the people of East Africa. And I wouldn't mind if that were to be the lingua franca for Sub-Saharan Africa, I don't mind at all. But we must face credit and we must face facts. We as Africans are tribal by nature, we are ethnic by nature. That is why every Christmas, every Easter, every celebration that we have, we go back to where we come from. We go to our villages, we go to our town, that is who we are, and we're not going to deny that. What we are trying to do is to reassert who we are before the white man came and destroyed every vestige of honor and dignity that we once had. And in Biafra, we are going to restore that. And from Biafra, the rest of Black Africa will also be free. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for explaining the position of Pan-Africanism. Because critics talk about, as much as we are Pan-African station, we always talk about Pan-African unity. But I've argued my case before the AU and they said, you cannot talk of Pan-African unity. One, one part of Africa is bleeding. How, 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 how that cannot be. In Nigeria, there's one part bleeding. In Gabon, uh, sorry, Cameroon, there's one part bleeding. We can't talk about Pan-African and leave people who are bleeding. I am happy that you have touched the word Pan-Africanism. Many Africans, including your former leaders, have said Nigeria needs rearrangement. I, 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 I picked one, something from you. I want to see this rearrangement. What is this? Babangida, former President Babangida said Nigeria needs a rearrangement. Yes. Because it can't work anymore. The marriage cannot work. It is true oh, yes. that the marriage cannot work. It is true that the people, the Igbo, are discriminated. When they go to Abuja, they are told to go home. Where? See, yet the home is Nigeria. Abuja is Nigeria. I've done investigative work undercover, and I've discovered all these things I'm not being told by you. But I've been with my Nigerian people who have actually ended up being discriminated in their own country. So given this scenario, I want to find out from you, from what perspective do you think Africa should come in, the whole of Africa should come in to bring the plight of the Biafran people, the indigenous people whom you have been fighting for, how do we come in 
as Pan Africans? How you can come in is by doing what very courageous leaders in Africa did in relation to the case of South Sudan. Because in the case of Nigeria, the center can no longer hold. Everyone knows the whole world is aware of the fact that we are ideologically, psychologically, culturally, religiously, and socially diverse. There is no meeting point. It's a very good thing that you talked about East Africa, for instance. In East Africa, there is some semblance of cohesion because Kiswahili is the lingua franca. Perhaps somebody from Uganda may understand somebody or should I say some people from Tanzania. Some Tanzanians may be able to understand somebody, let's say, from Rwanda because they speak the same language, they have the same understanding. So that is the basis for building something called a national cohesion. In the case of Nigeria, that is conspicuously absent. It doesn't exist. Now, the fact of the matter is this. Africa, the way it is presently set up and constituted, are merely colonial constructs. Where you have people coexisting happily together, perhaps they are very fortunate. In the case of West Africa and Nigeria in particular, I have nothing, and I repeat, nothing in common with your average Fulani person. I have more things in common with even a white British person than I do with a Fulani person. I mean, we have nothing in common. Their value system is markedly different from ours. We cannot see eye to eye. I'll give a very simple example. The recent case of the banning of the movement of cattle on foot in the southern part of Nigeria, for instance. In the north, that is a normal thing for them to have. But in the south, it is absolutely strange having people walking around your neighborhood with AK-47. At the slightest provocation, they kill people. That type of culture is alien to those of us from the south. And that's what we are trying to say. And it's a very good thing that we are not alone in seeking for a distinct, or should I say, separate identity. Our Oduduwa, the, our Yoruba brothers are also asking for the same thing. Because they too have come to the realization that this Nigeria is unworkable. The Middle Belt is doing the same thing. It is not born out of hatred for anybody. That is the, that is the mistake that people keep making all the time. Most analysts and, should I say, um, news journalists tend to think that somehow we hate Nigeria. Of course, that is not the case. What we deplore, what we detest and, and, and cannot live with is the level of hypocrisy, the level of ethnic jingoism going on, being, of course, perpetrated by the Fulani people. And this is what I want all Pan-Africans to be able to see, that Biafra will be there piloting and moving the affairs of, Biaf of, of, of the whole of Africa forward. Because we have said it repeatedly, without Biafra standing on its own, the rest of Africa will continue to suffer and to flounder. And for us to be able to get to where we are supposed to be to, there has to be a very comprehensive and holistic rearrangement of the present state of Nigeria. You are well aware. I ask you to go and read at the comments and statements coming from Katrina Lang, the British High Commissioner to Nigeria. For the Every international norm and diplomatic protocol. That's what is happening in Nigeria. Nigeria is, doesn't exist as a country. It's not a nation. It's not a state. Nigeria is just a merely business enterprise. That everyone with a vested interest in Nigeria, by which I mean most European countries with their, with their companies in, their, in the oil and gas sector in Nigeria, all they want to do is to exploit and to take away without adding anything in. Ogoni hasn't been cleaned up. People are dying in river states right across from Iguacha and then the coastal region. Everywhere you go, there is mayhem and disorder. In Lagos this morning, the same thing. Everywhere you go to Nigeria is crumbling because there is a palpable, a palpable agenda of the full and agenda with caliphate to take over the lands belonging to genus populations. And we have said no to that. We're not going to allow it and we cannot, we're not going to have it. Okay. Thank you very much. You brought me to a very serious question. A, very, a, a question that has been nagging both the locals, Africans on the continent and the question of external DACA forces. 
you have just mentioned people who are running the show, the oil companies. For example, they are watching. They have never raised anything on BBC, CNN, or international agencies. We don't hear, apart from we struggling as Africans ourselves, these agencies are not helping to say there are human rights abuses in Nigeria. For example, Nigeria, the, the American embassy closed its consulate in Abuja because of the huge numbers of people applying for asylum to go to the United States. But American embassy did not go far and the American government did not go far to condemn and put sanctions on why on Buhari for failing to, to contain the malaise that has killed Nigeria. Two, if you look at the total oil, Shell BP, they have taken part in extraction of minerals, oil, and so on and so forth. They are doing it when they are seeing human rights abuses in the southeast of Nigeria. What do you say about that? It is because we allowed them to. Total is an oil company, it's a private concern. Of course, it's a huge corporation, we know that. The same goes for Shell, for BP, for Halliburton, for ExxonMobil and all the rest of them. They operate the way they like in Africa because we've allowed them to. I was in Texas a few months ago. Most of these oil companies are there. But the type of environmental degradation and damage that we're witnessing in Biafra land do not obtain in Texas because there they have laws governing their operation, how they exploit, how they should I say, extract and distribute this very vital natural resource. But because Nigeria, we, I think it's a cliche that Nigeria is corrupt. What, what people don't understand is the depth of the damaging effect of corruption that you have. And I'll give a very simple example. We cannot expect white people to have regard for us when we do not have regard for ourselves. That can never, ever happen. Do you know that in Nigeria they import fuel? Are you aware that Nigeria imports yes, petrol? Yes, I've seen, I've seen, seen the queue. I've seen the queue at the petrol station, yes. Have you, do you know that Nigeria imports kerosene? Okay. They have five viable state-of-the-art refineries. Not one of them is functioning, not one single one. When white people are operating in such an environment, seeing how foolish and how stupid the entire country is in terms of their priorities, how do you then expect them to have respect for you or have regard for you? They can go into our land, they can pollute it. Katrina Lang, the British High Commissioner to Nigeria, can be running the show, or she likes, because there seems to be a recognition that these people do not reason like human beings. That is, that is the fact. That is the fact. Tell me what an, what an ambassador will be doing, crisscrossing the entire nation, telling them how to run their security architecture, telling them who to kill and, to, and who to spare. Our lawyer had the mom killed two days ago. Okorafo, Baris Okorafo, the mother was assassinated only two days ago, all because he was exposing what the army is doing to innocent people. That tells you all you need to know about Nigeria. Nigeria is an albatross around the neck of Africa. Nigeria is the country, the only country in Africa, actually dragging black Africa backwards because of their ineptitude, because of their criminal mindset, and because of the drive of the fallen in to dip the Quran in the Atlantic Ocean. That is the problem. There is nothing wrong with Islam, don't get me wrong. There are some very wrong interpretations of the religion of Muhammad that the Fulanese are using as the driving factor in their push to take over the land belonging to the indigenous people all across Nigeria. They've done the same thing to a relative extent in the Middle Belt. They took a chunk of Yoruba land in Elorin. We had to have an emirate today. The same thing they're trying to do in our land, and we said no to it. And the whole world is there. The US mission is in Nigeria. The UK is in Nigeria. EU is in Nigeria. The UN is in Nigeria. And there is wholesale murder and slaughter of people going on in Biafra as I speak to you right now.
this very minute. The same people then claim they know where Boko Haram is from where they launched the attack. The same country is openly supporting ISIS in West Africa. Go to the newspaper pages yesterday, you will see it there. Nigeria government actually supporting ISIS to take over the terror franchise from Boko Haram. They are not hiding it anymore. There's a terrorist who is there as a minister. Now tell me which country in the world will allow a terror sympathizer to be a minister of state only in Nigeria. How can such a country be allowed to exist? Because of what some corrupt people are gaining in America. Because of what some corrupt individuals are, are, are gaining from Europe. Because of the corrupt tendencies of Katrina Lang, who is the UK High Commissioner to Nigeria. That is what is happening to us. And because we have no reason to challenge this very orthodoxy of repression and oppression, that is why that woman keeps calipanting all over the place, deciding who should leave and who should be killed. It is not the fault of Total, not the fault of Shell, not the fault of Mobile. We allowed them, we created the environment to allow them to be so corrupt that now they're controlling our lives. And that is what Biafra will be in turn. And I did not say that Biafra will stop the business of Total. I never said that we will not do business with Shell. No, not at all. But it has to be business between two human beings, not a set of human beings and one set of animals. Thank, Thank you. you very much for, for that question. Let me come back to the question of referendum. You parted ways, and the most of us have parted ways with Buhari about the referendum. The people of Biafra have said, and the entire Nigeria, not only Biafra, most people that I meet or whom I've met, including Obasanjo, several times I've confronted Obasanjo. By the way, me and Obasanjo, we, we, we can't sit on the table for two minutes without exchanging t tables because I can't manage. I have asked, and Obasanjo said, asked, why don't you give a referendum? You, the marriage is broken. The marriage is gone. The marriage is not worth it. Do you think the referendum issue now can help to stabilize Nigeria? And if so, when and how can African Union, the Commonwealth, the Af European Union, and the UN can help to make sure that this referendum is put in place. The only way to go is a referendum because I am a democrat at heart. I believe that democratic, with the democratic will of the people must be expressed at all times and that is the basic governing principle of any viable society. I am an advocate of referendum and the sooner they conduct it, the better. It's been muted in the past through their so-called rejigging of their constitution through their so-called sovereign national conference, which has been coming on and off from time to time. Any new arrangement that seeks to keep Nigeria together as one must be subject to the will of the people. So either way, a referendum is going to come anyway. It may be delayed, but it is ultimately going to come. Now, one thing you must understand is this. There are very corrupt countries around the world, maybe um, on the surface of it, they're not corrupt. But they, are, they have very corrupt operators that will prefer Nigeria to remain in the very hopeless state that it is in at the moment. Nigeria is in a very hopeless state. A lot of people are making money by virtue of the corrupt nature of Nigeria. Do you know that Shell BP can sell a million barrels of crude oil in a day and only report that they only sold 100? Do you know there is no meter? Where the crude oil is being loaded onto the tankers at the terminal, in Biafra land where I come from, there is no meter. You can take as much as you like and declare whatever you like. These interests want to keep Nigeria warm. Every ambassador to Nigeria gets a welcome handshake of $1 million. Once you're posted to Nigeria from a, a well-to-do country, so to speak, the ambassador is bribed immediately there and then. That is how you start your work. You will not believe what I'm about to tell you. Do you know that the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria organized, or should I say, convinced the Biden administration to allow the U.S. military to come for an exercise in the Gulf of Guinea in order to checkmate Biafra and Ambazonia, freedom fighters? The same people did not go to the north. 
where they have Boko Haram, where they have ISIS, where they have Ansaru, where they have full and headsmen terrorists. People tormenting, killing, raping, kidnapping, and pillaging on a blessed every blessed day they do this. Do you know that it is not the recommendation of the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria that U.S. must commit their troops to the north? But they are in the Gulf of Guinea, exercising, saying that we dare to fight crime both on land and on sea. But there is no crime going on. The, the places where the crimes are going on are all in the Sharia north. And I want to bring you back to this idea of referendum once again. Do you know that the northerners, the Fulani people, they agitated for Sharia in the 12 northern Fulani controlled states of Nigeria, excluding Middle Belt? Do you know that your good friend, as you are saying, Obasanjo, gave it to them? It's not my no good referendum. friend. They're <laughs> <laughs> your good friend because I, I hate you more than you do. Okay. The man is a joke. Let me tell you this. Do you know that the Fulanese campaigned, including Buhari, of course, the late one who is in Saudi Arabia somewhere in, in, in a shallow grave. Do you know that these people campaigned for Sharia to be introduced in Fulani controlled northern states? I think about 12 or 13 states. There was no who had, nobody opposed them. In other words, the Fulanese themselves have divided Nigeria into two by virtue of their insistence on having Sharia. That is why today the Chief Justice of Nigeria is a Sharia lawyer, not a secular lawyer, not a secular judge, a Sharia court judge elevated to the position of uh, the Chief Justice of a secular federation. Yeah, yeah, now yeah, you tell me. Yeah, 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 Your Excellency, Namdi Khan, there is this the man, the Chief Justice who said his papers were eaten by termites. That's correct, yes. It's him. Oh my God. That's the type of con yes, yes, continue. It's him. He is a Sharia court. He's an Alekali in a Sharia court. But today, he is the chief justice of a secular state practicing common law. Where, how do you expect us to accept such nonsense? Who in their right mind will live under such condition? Who in their right mind will? That is what we want Africans to understand. It's not that we hate anybody. We are pan Africanists. I want one Africa. I want one United Africa. But an Africa found on the basis of justice, fairness, equity, and progress. Not one found on retrogression, on backwardness, on corruption, on stealing, and on looting. That tells you all you need to know about Nigeria. Can you tell me why they're deploying troops to Biafra at the moment? Killing people every blessed day. The same people drafting or asking their troops to be deployed to Biafra land, they know where Boko Haram are. They know where to find ISIS in the north. But they will not go and confront them. It's only to come to the east to kill people because we are peaceful. Such injustice we are no longer prepared to tolerate. And that is why, referendum or no referendum, we are going. We are going. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Namdi Khan. Let me bring you back to 1966. Several constitutions had been negotiated. But none addressed the fundamental question of social justice differences, political tensions, economic marginalization, competition, ethnic imbalances. In all this, from 1966, several constitutions have been brought. People started fighting. In 67, the war ended. Since then, military, upon the military, took power over Sanjo, Babangida, another one who died, and another one, several of them. The changes... Nobody has been mentioning what ails Nigeria. At the center of it, it looks like you are mentioning it now. I can see any observer on Nigeria can see your plight. Like just as we can see the plight of many African countries. When you talk of 13 states having Sharia law, a chief justice who says, his papers were eaten by termites, becomes the chief justice based on Sharia law and using Commonwealth 
common law. Now, should the changes be made and should the adjustment be made, is there any hope that Nigeria remains alone? This is a question from a very senior head, state, head, head of state in Africa. He has asked me just now, should, I should put it to you. It's from the southern part of Africa. Can Nigeria remain together in case these are addressed? Yes, sir. It is up to the people of Nigeria to decide if they want to be together or not. During a referendum or a place besides, I'm only entitled to just one vote. Only one vote. It is now left for the people to decide what to do. That is why we said to Nigeria, we don't want to break away unilaterally. We want it to be done with the consent of the people. And during the um, early life of this APC terrorist regime in Nigeria, they did actually mute the idea. They discussed it among themselves that whatever new arrangement is being proposed must be subject to the will of the people. I will say to that question, let the people decide. Anything they decide, I'll, I'll go with it. Anything that people come together to decide, this is what we want to do, I will submit myself to because I am a Democrat. What I'm trying to say is that the present condition of Nigeria is no longer tenable. It is no longer tenable. It cannot be tolerated any longer. And that's why we're doing what we can legally and legitimately to bring it to an end. Okay. Let's come to African Union. President Uhuru Kenyatta is the chairperson of Africa, or Kenya, is the chairperson of African Union Peace Security Council. He sits, is the chairperson of all peace and security arrangement in Africa. He is also a member of United Nations Security Council, representing Sub-Saharan Africa. He has huge numbers of Nigerians seeking asylum every day in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. What do you want him to hear? What do you want him to hear now? What message what do you give to them, to the AU, that the situation is not as they think so that people can wake up and help you? What I want President Uhuru Kenyatta to understand is this. Contrary to all the fallacious lies and misinformation coming from Nigeria, we are not against African unity. We want Africa to prosper. And what is happening from what you've said, what is what they're experiencing now in Kenya and in other East African countries in terms of the huge numbers of people seeking refugee status and asylum, is indicative of the decay and the death that Nigeria is going through at the moment. And unless they step in now to do the right thing, believe you me, they will get millions upon millions of people asking for asylum in their countries in no distant future. Let it not be said that the disintegration of Nigeria will somehow bring an end to Africa's cohesion and unity. It is a lie. It is a lie. It will strengthen it. Nigeria is the country dragging Africa backwards, being purportedly the most populous nation, black nation in the world, with vast reserves of oil and gas in my land in Biafra. A lot has been expected of Nigeria over the years, but each time they have failed. If you go to a place like Rwanda that I'm sure you have been to, if you go to Kigali and see what Paul Kekame has been able to do with meager resources that they have, I am sure the same transformation is taking place all across Ethiopia, taking place all across Kenya. You can see viability of economic life and prospects. None of that exists in Nigeria. They only sell crude oil and they import everything, including refined petrol as well. What I want African leaders to understand today is this, that Nigeria is the problem of Africa. If you terminate Nigeria, it's like a cancer growing somewhere on the body of Africa. 
Once you get rid of Nigeria, believe you me, Africa will spring to life. Let them not be deceived. Don't allow yourselves to be deceived to think that we need this huge country with huge population and vast natural resources to be relevant in the world, on the world stage. That is a lie. Because the size of Nigeria, the way it is today, was predetermined by our colonial masters. Britain said, we want to use Nigeria to influence every other country in Africa. That was their game plan. Britain wanted to control Africa through Nigeria. It's there in the official documents. And I'm saying to Africans today, don't allow that to happen. And as you say, the level of full and mediocrity in Nigeria has made it almost impossible. The best way for us to go is for Africans to understand that Nigeria is a tumor, a cancerous tumor, very dangerous one. Cut it out and Africa will be free. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to you to take a slow pace now. I want to come to ask a question that has happened to me also. We seem to be swimming in the same field. That's why you see we are the same. The loss of your parents. You did not attend. I also did not attend the death of my father. I have never buried him him I am in the same category like you I want us to go slow and say you were not allowed to attend to bury your parents how did you handle this I know I am slightly older than you in years I have handled are you sure yes I am are you sure I'm 65 <laughs> My goodness, you look very young. Yes, I'm 65. Look, and uh, that's very good. I have, when I lost my parents, I was also in exile in Britain and I could not bury them. How did you yourself handle this matter and how do you encourage others? There are millions, there are millions of refugees on the African continent in South Sudan. Some of them don't know where their parents are. But the people have gone to make political uh, leadership, but they have forgotten accountability. That's, That's why South Sudan uh, peace process is collapsing. Because there's no accountability. So how did you handle that? And uh, did it encourage you and uh, give you resolve to keep pushing for a better Nigeria or a better Biafra? Please. It's keeps me pushing for a better society for everybody. Everybody, not just within Biafra or within the wider Nigeria, but across Africa as a whole. Because what concerns one black person actually should concern another black person as well. I put my parents' murder by the Nigerian state into context. The only thing that matters to me is the freedom for Biafra of which I am prepared to pay whatever price that God requires of me to pay in order to ensure that Biafrans are set free. That was how I managed to, should I say, compartmentalize that very grief at that moment in time. And I might also add that my mother-in-law is dead as a result of the same thing. Two days ago, one of our lead attorneys, they actually threw a hand grenade into the mother's car and killed her and burnt our body only two days ago. I see these things as necessary sacrifice that we must go through in order to restore Biafra that is essentially the kingdom of God upon the face of this very earth. For that, we are prepared to pay whatever price that we are called upon to pay to ensure that the people of Biafra and every other ethnic group being oppressed in Nigeria and wider Africa is set free. That's my mindset. And that was how I dealt with it. As horrible as it, as it was that I couldn't attend as the first child and as the first son, my father's burial, my mother's burial, but I see them as being very essential sacrifices that one has to make in order to ensure that these people are set free. Thank you very much. I am also the first son, so maybe that's uh -huh. why I started fighting for the Biafran people. 
let me come back, mm. take you back to the question of Boko Haram. Yes. You mentioned one point which is very clear. Security agencies across Africa would like to know what ails. What, why, why, why is it, is Buhari, by the way, is Buhari Buhari or we have a problem here? Because a human being should understand that people are dying. The army, Nigeria has a huge army. Is the army a coward? Are they cowards? Do they protect who? Are they protecting the territory of Nigeria? Have they, 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 how does the army allow people to come and kidnap citizens, take them, then in piecemeal release them two, three, four back? Who are these? Are this, is it an internal collaboration between the army, Buhari, and his generals? Who is commanding this army? Surely, the army that cannot even rescue five students from girls who have been abducted. What type of army is this? Is there a bigger thing than Boko Haram? I, I have been requested by another reader from Tanzania to say, why is this Boko Haram menace never cleared? Why is Nigeria not asking for external help to come in to help them? Is it because they want it themselves? Please shed some light to our viewers. I want Africans to understand one fact today. The entire terror architecture in Nigeria is hinged on the political aspirations and hegemonic tendencies of only one tribe, the Fulani. We have no issues with the Hausa, the Bachama people, and all the rest of them. It is the Fulani. And this game plan has been in existence for a very, very long time, nearly 200 years ago. And they must execute it. I want Africans to understand that only the Fulani tribe alone financed and sponsored almost six terror groups exclusively by themselves. Before Buhari came into power in 2015, he said, at the height of the insurgency, an attack against Boko Haram is an attack against the North. I will leave that to one side. I want your viewers to understand something today, which previously maybe they may not have been aware of. Do you know that Boko Haram nominated Buhari as their chief negotiator in 2014-2015? Are people aware of that at all? Do you know that these same people only a few years ago said that these murderers and these rapists, they are our misguided brothers? Do you know that their so-called Sheikh Gumi, who happens to be very close to the presidency, I need you to understand this very clearly. The one negotiating with the bandits. Are you aware that their recommendation is for ISIS and Boko Haram to merge together, that they can come south? I want these points to be noted by your viewers all over the world. So when you see these people, you ask them these questions. Do you also know that the leader of the dreaded ISIS in West Africa province, ISWAP, his name is Al Banawi. Al Banawi is the son of Yusuf Muhammad, the founder of Boko Haram. Do you know that this man was arrested around about the same time that I was in detention in 2015? Do you know that he was released without trial on the orders of the presidency of Nigeria? Do you know that the fourth largest terror group in the world, the Fulani headsmen, which the whole world knows, the fourth largest terror group in the world, the Amiyat Yala, do you know that the presidential spokesman came out and said live on national television that these terrorists are legitimate stakeholders in the government, in the governance of Nigeria? Are you aware of that? Do you know that despite telling the whole world that these murderers and these killers are from the Sahel, they are not Nigerian Fulanese? Do you know they're forcing us today 
to give them our land so they can settle in perpetuity. Are you aware of that? Let me also shock you this morning from the office of the Inspector General of Police of Nigeria. A letter came out titled Terror Elements to Expand Frontiers of Attack. In this very letter signed on behalf of the Inspector General of Police of Nigeria, of which Katona Lang and the U.S. Ambassador are both aware. Here, they mentioned the specific places where they claim the leaders of Boko Haram are hiding. Understand this. I want the world to know that this full learning expansionism is a well-planned, orchestrated move to take over the land of indigenous people and hand it over to marauding Fulani Nomads across the Sahel. A letter from the IG of Police of Nigeria. In this very letter, they mentioned the names of the places where they felt or they believed their intelligence told them that these people are hiding. They did not send Nigeria army or police there to go and confront them. Instead, they sent them to Imo State. They sent them to Abia in Biafra land and gave them an order to shoot at sight. And I want you as a journalist, I want you as a lawyer to go back and investigate through the history of Fulani funded terrorism and insurgency in Nigeria. Try and see if there is any instance where the IG of police or the chief of army staff has ever said to the troops, shoot at sight anywhere in the north. It's never happened before. Only in Biafra, a few days ago. That is to tell you that this is a well-planned pincer movement, basically from the east and from the west, in order to try to take over the geopolitical space of Nigeria for Fulanis across the Sahel. These are the things you need to understand. Ask yourself this question. You've been talking about Boko Haram, Boko Haram, ISIS, all these murderers all over the place. Ask yourself this question. Has any Boko Haram been convicted before of any crime in Nigeria? Ask yourself this question. Now, let me put it to Africans and to the whole world at large on this your program today. I know that a while back, Al Shabaab attacked a few shopping malls in Kenya. Is that correct? Yes. Now, maybe you live in Kenya. You are now residing in Kenya. Is that correct? Don't, yes. I don't worry. Yes. I am here. Now, how do you think Kenyans will feel if President Uhuru Kenyatta were to grant some kind of amnesty to Al Shabaab to now say, Al Shabaab, you know what? Come and become part of Kenyan army. How would you feel? <laughs> I think the Kenyans will go to the streets. The Kenyans, will, you, in, the Kenyans will catch the Al Shabaab and we roast them on the streets. Now, let me tell you this. This is something that Africans don't know. Yes. Do you know that Nigerian army being sent to Biafra land today contains elements of Boko Haram and ISIS in it? Yes. Because I, they are now part of us. I've seen the reports, yes. Now, let me ask you this question. When people say we shouldn't fight the army or their police, how do we know who they sent to us? How can you distinguish between a terrorist in army uniform and a serving patriot in Nigerian army? That's the question I'm asking the whole world to answer. How do we know? They, they incorporated terrorists into their security architecture. How do we know who is who? Okay. How? 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 Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let's just take a short break and take water because it is okay. hot in here. And I think whatever you are is also hot. It is, yes. The interview has, is fantastic. It has generated one of the huge, huge numbers in the history of, of Pan-Africans and this television station. So let me take some water. You take some water. We resume in two okay. minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, sir. On that question Thank and you. the world, how do you differentiate between Boko Haram and Nigerian army? When simple, Boko Haram, simple question. When Boko Haram has been inscripted, that's better English, yeah. inscripted in Nigerian army to come and kill Simple. the people of the yes. Southeast. That is the question on the table. When we return, this is Matsanga Africa perspective. In Matsanga Africa perspective, 
we look for hot spots. One of the hot spots is Nigeria. Is Nigeria disintegrating? Is Nigeria fragmenting to pieces? Is there leadership in Nigeria? Is General Buhari, the general we saw 10 years ago, or oh, this is a different person? How can a leader allow his people to die? How can you inscript a Boko Haram to be a minister in your own government? Oh my God, is there something wrong? A country that we all looked at as a country, the big giant of Africa. We saw everything in Nigeria. Now it looks like what my good writer, the man who wrote the things fall apart. Kinawa Chebe was right. The center cannot hold anymore. This state is going. Don't go away. Just we are returning. This is a fantastic show from Punchline Africa Television. We are interviewing His Excellency Namudi Kanu, the leader of IPOB. Indigenous people of Biafra. Thank you. Conflicts exist on this continent. One of the most ranging conflicts on the continent of Africa is the question of Biafra. From 1965 or before that, the Biafrans had their own institutions. Before the colonial master arrived, they have agitated themselves, they have told the world they want fair treatment in a nation cobbled called Nigeria. Successive regimes have always trampled upon the rights of the people of Biafra destroyed them, killed their younger men, assassinated many, deported many, excluded many, forceful deportation out of your own country. Time has come for the new generation in 2020, 2021, 2022, for people to sit down to find a, an everlasting solution to the conflict that is around that region. President Buhari promised us that he will finish in 100 days, the first term of office, Boko Haram will be dead. Today is finishing his second term. Boko Haram is even more vibrant than his own shoes. We have landed in very serious market waters that the people of Nigeria don't know which direction they are going. The people of Nigeria, a big country with a big population and the economic hub of West Africa and Africa with the biggest reserves of oil still lingers in poverty. The poverty and the rich gaps in Nigeria are wider than the distance between, like, than the distance between us and us. What can we do for our countries in Africa? How do we unite? For us, our role is to speak, to defend the voiceless, to dis to chart our way forward, to find a solution. The only way solution can be got on the night, Biafra issues a referendum, which Buhari and the government present have refused. But sincerely speaking, Nigeria needs rearrangement. If that rearrangement does not come today, tomorrow, or the other day, 
one day it is going to explode. People can be pushed, but they cannot be pushed beyond what their friends have been pushed. The suffering is too much. Pictures that I cannot show on this television. I call upon President Uru Kenyatta as a member of the United Nations Security Council to see that some of these problems should be resolved and a resolution is passed of sitting down to understand the difficulties of the nations, especially in Nigeria, in Cameroon, because the problem of, of Biafra is also similar to the problem of Amazonia. The English-speaking people have no say in Cameroon. They are taken as second-class citizens. Biafrans are also taken as second-class citizens in a country called Nigeria. Their problems are compounded with a dictator who has lost direction, who doesn't know where the wind is blowing from, whether east of Sahara or west of Sahara, he's going north when the wind is going north, south. Therefore, he's blown one leg going up, one leg going down. Look at the picture of Buhari standing 6.1 feet, being blown apart. Thank you. Punchline Africa Television. Our show is Matanga Africa Perspective. In Matanga Pers Africa Perspective, we look at what ails Africa, what kills Africa, what makes Africa be called a continent of savages. As we can see in Nigeria, that name cannot go away. Boko Haram is killing people, staking people. We have incorporated it in the system of the Nigerian army. Brought them back without remorsefulness. They have not re done any reconciliation. And they are then being hired to destroy and kill other people. We have invited, and we shall invite more people to talk about this. We shall invite any other person who wants to discuss the issue why Nigeria is collapsing. A state, the center cannot hold anymore. With us in the studio and away taking questions from us is none other than the leader of IPOB, indigenous people of Biafra, His Excellency Mazi Namdi Kanu. Welcome back, sir. One question. Thank you very much. One question yes. after the break. We had to go for some water because it was becoming hot here. To hear that Boko Haram is 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 part and parcel of the government of Nigeria. I, I don't I, I, it is something that has sunk my heart. I don't know. But I am very shocked. Let me come to this. There is a feeling that time has come. And I will keep on going back to this question. That the United Nations, the five permanent members, are part and parcel of their problem. Now, because you can't exclude any, China is already in Nigeria also. Russia is in Nigeria. America has been there. Britain is there. France, through Total Oil, their presence is there. And a candid question comes. We, we touched it, then we went away. But it is coming back from the questions I've read during the break. Someone from South Africa is asking, surely, do these permanent 
members of the United Nations have eyes. Do they see? Because there are some clips here which I don't want to show you on this TV. They are very bad. As far as the killings of the youth in the southeast in Biafra. The killings, the slaughter, the torture by the army. By Nigerian army. How they tie youths on their Land Rovers and roll them around the villages. I get these pictures every day from Onita. These are not photoshopped. These are real things happening in Nigeria. So someone has asked, does the United Nations Permanent Five have eyes or not? What would you say to them now, today? As we find... I believe that. Yeah. Go on. They have eyes, but for some reason they have decided not to see the evil happening to Biafra. And this is what I want Africans to actually digest. Africans must ask themselves this question. <clears throat> Why is there this global conspiracy against Biafra? I have an answer to that. It is because Biafra portends goodwill for the whole of Africa. And they understand this very clearly. We cannot be blaming the Permanent Five of the UN because we are the ones that created the enabling environment for them to come in, to exploit, and to do whatever thing that they want to do. I was having a very serious discussion with somebody, and I said to them, do you think that the world prefers this very exploitative relationship that they have with the very corrupt subsequent corrupt regimes that you have in Nigeria? The person said yes, and I said no. The answer is no. USA is more concerned about trade with Japan and the EU more than they will with Nigeria. Because in all these economies, people want where they can ship their goods and services to be purchased. They needed to have the spending power. That was the reason behind the USA helping Germany to stand on its feet after the Second World War. The reconstruction of Europe by the US government was driven by economic self-preservation. People would want an Africa that is viable, an Africa that will be like the Southeast Asia, where high goods and services can be traded with ease. Not this very almost primitive, you know, exploitative relationship that they have in places like Nigeria. I don't blame China. I don't even blame Britain. I don't blame Halliburton, USA. I don't blame Ajib of Italy. I don't blame Shell of Netherlands. I don't blame any of these people. We are the ones that allowed them to come to exploit us. So we cannot blame them. See, in life, when you allow yourself to become a victim and you keep playing the victim card all the time, you go into, your mindset will go into a very vicious cycle of this victimhood and you can never come out of it. And I'm saying to black African people all over the world, if you believe in the equality of every man born, if you believe that all men were created equal by God, then anything white people can do, so also can you do it. If we cannot do what Europeans can do, what Americans can do, what South Americans can do, what Asians can do, we cannot lay any claim at all to human equality. It is our fault, not the fault of the permanent five. I go back to what I said before. It was these same people that gave oil and gas concessions to the United Kingdom. That was why they persecuted the Biafran war for them. It wasn't a white man. These were black people. Go one is a black man. It was go one that said no to restructuring. Or Bassanjo fought on the side of the colonial masters. That is the history of Africa. Joining your oppressors to defeat your own people. That's exactly what is playing out in Nigeria. Nothing more, nothing less. I have, I cannot possibly apportion blame to anybody whatsoever. We should be blaming ourselves because in Africa, we tend to blame other people all the time, whereas the fault lies with us. The fault is ours. I remember one thing that the Chinese government said in 1999 when they took back Hong Kong. The Chinese government said the 100 years of shame has come to an end. They never blamed anybody. They never blamed the British. They blamed themselves for losing Hong Kong in the first place to the British. And that is how real men 
should be able to appraise their condition. That we are poor, we are ravaged by poverty, disease, ignorance, and backwardness in Africa is our fault. Not the fault of the European Union. If we decide to rise up tomorrow to say enough is enough, believe you me, we can transform Africa within only two years. After all, Bokagami is doing something in, in Kigali. Why can't we replicate it everywhere else? We must learn to put our people first. When a head of state gets up in the morning and buys a property in Europe, what do you expect? That means you don't love your people. When he gets up in the morning and decides to buy a private jet, that means he doesn't love his people. And these are clear facts. I cannot blame anybody for our plight. I blame ourselves for it. And that is why we are rising up. And I want to make this thing categorically clear so that the whole world can understand me. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what the greatest powers on this earth do in relation to Nigeria. Biafra is going to be free or we all die in the process, I swear to God Almighty in heaven. Death is better than what we are passing through right now in that zoo called Nigeria. And we must be free. I said must. We are not begging anybody for it. It's about before the white man came, there was Biafra. Before Britain was created, Biafra existed for over 5,000 years before the formation of Britain. How did they decide where I should live? How did they decide which identity I should have? How can a white man come from Europe and decide to call me a Nigerian? What is the meaning of Nigeria? Nobody knows. We must go back to who we are. Be proud of who we are. I am a proud Biafran. I can never be a proud Nigerian because the name Nigeria has no meaning. No meaning whatsoever. Not even in Swahili, it has no meaning. How can a white man come and get a country for me in Africa and I be holding their flag running up and down saying this is my country? Who said so? Can I go to Europe and get a country in Europe for them? On what basis is our argument of human equality when Europeans can come to Africa and create countries? We cannot go to Europe to create countries. How can that be equality? Oh. That is why racist towards us. And that is why we must rise up now, not tomorrow, to support Biafra. Biafra is the beginning of the true emancipation of black people. Ask Julius Nyerere and he will tell you. Thank you. Julius Nyerere, indeed. In 1967, the late Julius Nyerere was the first man with Dr. Milton Obote. That's why I, on this microphone, I still carry the flag of Dr. Milton Obote. They are the first countries in Africa to recognize Biafra. So in case people are asking why we have interest in Biafra, I follow both the leaders because I have lived in Tanzania and I'm a Ugandan. And I live in Kenya. I live in Europe. I'm a global citizen. I follow Pan-Africanism. Indeed, one other question before I bring this to your side. You address your people and then we make it, call it a day. We have covered most of the things. Some of them you will bring them in your own address, which you will be given a chance to do so in 15 minutes or so. There are so many ways, constitutional ways, of struggling for freedom. I believe you know where I'm going now. Of course, yes. We have tried. For over 10 years, you have tried. You have done so well. You have awoken the, the people and said, wake up. We are being slashed one by one. Buhari has allowed people to buy daggers. You know, I, I saw my investigative journalist came across 100,000 daggers. How do you buy daggers for who? You import daggers. Are there so many cows to slaughter in that place? This, I, I, I looked at it and said, these are daggers to come and kill other people. If the constitutional root of referendum fails, what other constitutional means would you use? We insist on constitutionality. Yes. And we are going to have it. <laughs> when, when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King started to try to rearrange the social order in America, 
some people felt it was impossible to do, but eventually he succeeded. When Nelson Mandela, and I'm sure your good self, and all other anti-apartheid campaigners started, even with the support of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, this is something people don't know, that Ronald Reagan, a very powerful president of the U.S., and Margaret Thatcher, of course, the young lady, they all supported apartheid South Africa. They did. They were the ones that labeled ANC a terrorist group. Some people don't know this. It was only a few years ago that the name of Mandela was, should I say, erased from the, the logbook of terrorists in the United States of America. People don't know this. We are going to insist on what is ours and what is right. We've been occupying our land in perpetuity since the creation of man on this very earth. Somebody came and decided to change our identity and we said no. The person said, okay, if I'm leaving, I'm going to hand you over to a more brutal caretaker, which are the Fulanis in this case. And that is why they're killing us and killing us till tomorrow. I want to draw your attention to something very, very critical. The order given by the Inspector General of Police of Nigeria to predominantly Fulani soldiers and Fulani police people to go to Biafra land to kill people. Had this announcement been made by any other police chief anywhere in the world, believe you me, there will be someone to appear in here the next day. I want to read for your audience. I'm going to quote him verbatim what he said. The IG of police in Nigeria said, he's a full animal, mind you, don't mind the media shout, do the job I command you. If anyone accuses you of human rights violation, the reports will come to my table and you know what I will do. So take the battle to them, wherever they are, and kill them all. Kill their friends all. Don't wait for an order. What another order are you waiting for when Mr. President has ordered you to shoot anybody carrying AK-47 assault rifle? Quote me, even a dead policeman can be tried and dismissed from the force and his family will not get his benefits. And this is from a police chief. Do you know the funniest thing? Or should I say the most astonishing thing of all? The EU has a presence in Abuja, in Nigeria. The British High Commissioner is there, Katuna Lime. The US Ambassador is there. They've not said anything at all. In other words, that leads us now to believe that exactly what happened between 66 and 1970 is about to happen again, which is kill as many Biafrans as possible. I want all Africans to understand this. That this very policy of genocide and slaughter is sanctioned by the U.S. ambassador in Nigeria, sanctioned by the U.K. of all people. Tomorrow they'll be singing songs of praise about human rights abuses, what China is doing, what is happening in Gaza, what is happening in, in Rohingya. But in, in Nigeria, they sanctioned the killing of Biafras in broad daylight. What sort of justice is that, I ask? And I want Africans to know, to ask themselves this question, why is it that the USA and Britain wants this very tiny country to be squashed and killed? What is it that they have that is driving them so mad? Because the future progress of Africa lies in the land of Biafra, and they do not want black people to be developed. That is why they're doing what they're doing. Look at a whole, should I say, high commission running all over the place, telling the country how to be run. The same things that Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Azikiwe, all of them, but it's Lumumba, mm. The mm. same mm. thing that man fought. Black people are now tolerating it. The same thing we are fighting, we want independence, we want self-rule today, today, this very morning or afternoon or evening. A one single woman, one woman is, is crossing the whole of Nigeria, telling the Nigeria police who to kill, telling them who to, to shoot at. Now tell me how I can be in a country where the chief of police have targeted my people for extermination and the whole world is quiet. Tomorrow they'll start blaming us for one thing or the other. But we're not backing down because Biafra is coming and I assure you no Jupiter can stop it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to ask my final question. 
what does the future look like for Biafra? I'm interested in that. What does the future? Because let me come first. I've struggled for Sudan. My television and my TV struggled for Gambia. You remember you were listening to me when Yaya Jame switched off all yes. television stations in, in Gambia. I took yes. my satellite quietly in Gambia. And Yaya, with all the army, could not know that I was broadcasting from his own place. I took my satellite phone and we did help to liberate Gambia. I'm proud that South Sudan today, I played a part to call Dr. Riyak Macha. You know, at the time, the people, Your Excellency Namdi Khan, think that when you interview a man who has a different opinion from the government, you are giving them platform, yes. We must hear when we talk, then violence will stop. If we keep quiet, then we shall perpetuate violence. So we should keep on talking. And I picked up a phone called Riyakamacha in South Africa, where he had been put under house arrest. I shouted on this television to Igad and the AU. I made noise to the British and the Commonwealth Office. I said, how do you lock a person who should be negotiating peace in South Sudan? Took about two months, three months. Riyaka was set free. Was told you can now start the negotiations. Everything I've touched on African continent in my 65 years, I've resolved. I resolved a big huge conflict in Uganda. I think you already know. Between the yes, Lord Resistance yeah. Army and the President Museven, people of feared course. to go to the bush to look for this man, younger man called Kony, very young, still 40-something. I went. I said, you are killing people. People want you to talk. And we have come here. If you want to kill us, you can also kill us. I'm a determined man. I want you to paint for us a picture of a Biafra that does not look Savimbi way. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from. You have read the Savimbi history. Oh, I I we give him everything. <laughs> then he turns up. He misuses. He lets us down. Sudan, South Sudan, look, we give them time, Riyaka comes back, they fight again over power. I have been there for Cameroon. The Amazonian people, I'm bringing them again. Now, they have several factions. You don't know whom to call. One calls you, don't call that one. Don't call this one. That, you see, these are things that worry me in Africa. Paint for me the picture of a Biafra you want. Yeah. Whether today, the, tomorrow, whether you are there or not there, whether I'm there or not there, we want to see the picture of a Biafra. I love the people of Biafra, myself. I love them. With the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my heart, I love them. I don't care about Buhari, what he can say. Whether we meet at the AU, I will point fingers at him. I will. It is coronavirus that has made us not meet now. But if AU was meeting in night, I would wrestle him. I don't care. Because this is something that is paining the people of Africa. And you can't wear long council, this long clothes, and come there to impress us with your perfume when people are dying. Therefore, I want you to paint for me a picture of a Biafra. What type of Biafra? you want the type of biafra i want is the biafra of my ancestors the land of the free 
where people are allowed to pursue their daily endeavors without interference from any higher authority, where individual and collective autonomy of every component ethnic nationality within Biafra will be guaranteed, not just by law, but by virtue of our existence as dignified human beings. A Biafra that will be demilitarized, a Biafra that will be forward-looking, innovative, creative, run on clean, green energy, not reliant on gas or petrol. A Biafra where the police will not bear any arms. A Biafra where people can live and die and you will not see an armed soldier anywhere around you. A genuine republic, a land belonging to the people. We are going to cement this in the way we structure our society. A Biafra that will attract inward investment. A Biafra that will consider every necessity of life as being a human right. Not just in words, but in deed. A Biafra where there will be no strife, no rancor. A Biafra where all men and women will be equal, regardless of their religion, their sex, their creed, their orientation. A Biafra that will maintain open borders to every black soul on the face of this very earth. I do admit that geographically in terms of landmass, we, know we may not be that huge. The Biafra will operate, or should I say, run an open door policy. Every black person on the face of this earth will be an honorary citizen of Biafra, as long as you're not tainted by terrorism. That is the type of Biafra we want to run. The Biafra, where Europeans will sit back and say, we never knew that such innovation and creativity will be possible. A Biafra that, as should I say, the likes of Rwanda is a forerunner too, because today they are doing very well as well. That is the type of nation we are going to build. A truly democratic nation, not through the force of arms, but through dialogue and negotiations at all times. Nobody's going to lord it over anybody else. My ancestors never did. That is why we remain the only people not to conquer any other piece of territory and nobody conquered us until the white man came and our temple fell in 1904. That is the land we're going to go back to. A Biafra of very many nations, a Biafra of autonomous nations within, governing themselves according to their own rules. We are nobody will sit at the helm of power and dictates for others what to do. And we are going to accomplish it by the grace of God Almighty in heaven. Now, I know that constant references are being made to Southern Sudan. But I want to let people understand that even after the USA became free from British colonial rule, they also went through a very bitter civil war. And that did not stop them today from becoming preeminent in, in every sphere of human endeavor, militarily, economically, socially, in every way. So I do believe very strongly that Southern Sudan will rise up to be strong once again. All these are teething problems. You also mentioned the issue of factionalism. It is when people put the interest of themselves and their controllers well and above that of those that they are serving. That is why I said, and I have said this repeatedly, I will never ever lead Biafra politically. Once Biafra is restored, my job is done. I want to be able to prove to our people what sacrifice means so that those who will come after us will know how to treat our people with respect and with dignity. The thing about Africa is somebody gets into power and they want to stay there forever and ever see if there is something in it. The little work that I'm doing for Biafran people is very tiring, very, very stressful. Sometimes I don't even know how these presidents manage to sleep. Maybe they don't love their people that much. If you love your people, you cannot sleep at night. Any president in Africa who is not suffering from high blood pressure, you are not, you are not, you are not sick. That means you're doing something wrong. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. If you're concerned about your people, then I expect you to be very ill at all times. So that is the type of Biafra that we need. That's the type of Biafra we're going to have. A type of Biafra where 
the wealth, well-being of Southern Africa flows from. And I can assure you we are going to deliver it. We will deliver it. The Pan-Africanism that we talk about is going to start from Biafra. Because mind you, I did not say that we're just going to have Biafra and then we shut up all the borders. No. What we want to do is to return to our organic, political, cultural arrangement. Should their friends wake up the next day to say, oh, we want to be the same country with Oduduwa, all well and good. Should their friends wake up and say, oh, we want to expand into Ambazonia, all well and good. As long as you take the consent of the people with you, this nonsense that the Europeans did in Africa, we want to reverse it. That God Almighty heaven may look down and be very proud to say that at last, I have people who are after my heart. And that's what we intend to do with Biafra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Viewers, we seem to have covered most of the areas. It is the first time and it's not going to be the last time. Until we liberate, until we achieve the, the objectives, the aims, the vision of a better people on the African continent. His Excellency Mazi Namud Kanu will return at one time to give us his other views. By then, messages today, the leaders in Africa watching by the for your information, I linked this to South African President Ramaphosa. I linked this to of course, the president here, his handlers are watching. President Emerson Monagagwa, Office of Foreign Affairs, and his president's office, they are watching. Several Sadaka members and the several African, Your Excellency, the Pan African president in Kampala, President Yoweri Gakuta Museven, he has added another name which is very complicated, is uh, watching. Is interested in the Pan African uh, views. They are watching. They watched. But I want now to come down and slow down and give you a chance. Give you another five to six, ten minutes. Enjoy them. Tell your people the message. Send it to them. Videos of them, millions and millions of them, as we talk in Onita. In Abra, in all those places, in all those states in Southeast, those who are suffering under the heavy, disguised Boko Haram terrorists who have invaded, they are embedded in Nigerian army, coming to kill people. Give them hope. Give them hope that salvation is on the way. Give them hope that tomorrow, Will it be better tomorrow? Give them hope that Africa is aware. Give them hope that the world is not doing nothing. What we have done today has enlightened so many people, so many countries, countries that have Nigerian refugees who are fleeing because Nigeria is disintegrating. They are benefiting from this program. And it affects the security of the entire Africa. This floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this program. I've been a very big fan of yours for very many years. And um, I have studied you extensively. Once again, I accept my most humblest respect to you and to the entire crew that put this thing together today. I want our people to understand one very thing. At the end of this very race, Biafra is going to emerge. It doesn't matter what anybody does. And to our African friends and brethren, I want them to also understand this. We talk about Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism cannot take off without Biafra because we do need a genuinely free country in Africa to be able to drive that very critical and important initiative. We are seeking to build a country that God Almighty in heaven will be very proud of. And though 
the Janjaweed, the Fulani Caliphate have sent their armies of conquest into our land that this very day, we don't even know if those who are killing us are doing so on behalf of the Nigerian state or they're doing it on behalf of the Islamic Caliphate. Because as we well know, ISIS is now in Niger state. Very soon they'll be in Kogi, and then from Kogi they'll come into Anambra, and the real war will begin. Remember very many years ago, I told you one very critical point for you to bear in mind at all times. So basically to guide you in all your deliberations and your thinking about Biafra. They're going to kill us. That is true. But that is not going to stop Biafra from coming. We are going to do all we can to defend to defend our land and to defend our people. The whole world may appear to be against us. But we have done nothing wrong. That is the most frightening thing about this whole thing. If you ask the world, what did Biafra do wrong to you? Nobody can tell. Nobody can actually explain to you properly. Because they want a world where very illiterate, nomadic set of people will be in charge of governance. Where you have refineries and they're no longer working. Where you produce oil and gas, but still import kerosene and fuel for your cars. Where they want to impoverish the people. For those who may not be acquainted, or should I say familiar with the book that one of our very good friends wrote in years gone by, Walter Rodney. He was at Dayas Salaam University where he was assassinated by the CIA very many years ago. Walter Rodney wrote a very compelling book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. What we are witnessing today is precisely what he was trying to explain to us. If you allow yourselves to be taken over by greed, by self-preservation and the trappings that you find in North America and in Europe and in Far East Asia, you will never ever develop your land. We are fighting for Biafra that we may restore our lost dignity. We are fighting for Biafra that black people all over the world may be set free at last. We are fighting for Biafra not that we may have or commence the building of a large empire, not at all. We are asking for a Biafra where we can live and die with a semblance of dignity. Because right now people are dying, but there isn't any dignity. We must stand very tall and very strong, resist our enemies. That thing that we are thinking now that is impossible to accomplish very soon, you will say it. We must remain resilient. We must remain devoted. We must remain unflappable. We are not going to retreat, not one iota. If at the end of this race, there is only one Biafran man and one Biafran woman left, may they continue to expand. They killed us, five million of us, after the war. After the war in 1970, we had lost five million people. But there we are still the largest ethnic bloc anywhere in the entire Nigeria. Because God is faithful. And at this very critical time, this very Elohim that we worship is not going to abandon us. I'm not saying we're going to fold our hands in prayer and fasting alone. No, we are going to do what we have to do to ensure the survival of our race. An attempt has been made in the past to exterminate us. The British supported the killing and the mass slaughter of their friends because of crude oil and gas. That Ujibu told Harold Wilson, we cannot give to you. This resource belongs to the people, and that was the end of it. And he said, because of that, we're going to kill you. And sadly, Britain is still doing something till this very day. A supposedly civilized and advanced country, aiding and abating the slaughter of an indigenous population because of oil and gas. Therefore, I'm asking all of you to remain very resolute, to remain very strong. Do not allow yourself to become distracted. We have almost won. As Dr. Pasanga said here a short while ago, we have awoken the consciousness of not just ethnic nationalities within Nigeria, but the entire African continent as a whole. We have won the debate. Now is the time for us to restore Biafra. And once that is done, believe you me, everybody will come to Biafra and to pay homage. Or should I say pilgrimage in this case? So we are winning. Many are dying, I know that to be true. A few days ago, we lost the mother of our very, very formidable barrister, Okorafo. 
But it's, that's not going to stop us. Because I know that they will kill us, we will kill them in the end. Biafra will come. And Biafra is very, very close. I want our people to develop the mindset of the Afghanis. Never say die. There were a group of people called the Mao Mao in, in Kenya. There were a group of people called the Kumeko in our land. These are the two people that fought the British to a standstill. Go and ask anywhere. And the remnants, of course, of Benin Kingdom, we must acknowledge them because they also fought very gallantly as well. We did not fight because we didn't like the Bible that the white man brought to us or the whiskey that accompanied it. We fought because we are free people. The time has come for us to restore the kingdom of heaven upon the face of this earth. The time has come for Biafra to be reestablished. The time has come for black Africa to be free. The time has come for every black person, regardless of where you are in the world, to stand tall and to say, I am an African. Remain very strong, remain very resolute, and may you go be with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Before you go, I would like to show you the newspapers in Kenya, in Nairobi. You are very far. You must be missing some of these papers. The standard, can, can we, production team, I'm on the ground now. The standard newspaper in Kenya, the headline here is not on the Biafra where we still have. The only problem in Kenya, we don't have a crisis of dividing a nation. We have yes. the standard newspaper said, who failed Uhuru? The blame game. That's the headline. But one key thing that stands out in the newspapers, why we are struggling to put Africa in order, is His Excellency President Uhuru Mwingai Kenyatta last night opened one of the biggest ports in Africa. You talked of Nigeria having oil, but it doesn't have even petrol at the petrol station. Jesus Christ. Terrible. But President Terrible. Kenyatta, while yesterday opening the petrol, uh, the, the port in Lamu, he said this port will connect the east to the west, east to the north, east to the south. That is the thing that we have here now in Africa, in East Africa. We want to thank President Uru Kenyatta again for putting infrastructure for people to get in a car and drive, ten, take 10 days and arrive in Anabra. Is it Anabra? Yes. That's right. That's right. That's yes. what we want. I have been it's sent perfect. so many messages from Dubai. People yes. saying in Anabra, they are married there. Kenyans, Nigerians Very have good. married a lot of our people from East Africa. And I hope one day for us, my children, also one of them, my daughters, is married to an Igbo person from Onitsa. Wonderful. We know so how to take care of our wives. I am, do. I, we, are, we, are, we are united. Another newspaper says... Good things about Africa. The lamp put roars to life with the president is uh, good. You can see it. Yes, yes. And that's yes. it. And another good thing in Africa, I'm looking for Africa um, stories. For your information, I am a Liverpool supporter for 43 years like myself or i don't yes. know my god thank you very much it means it thank looks you, like we are all liverpool here but i the yes. others don't get worried we are now struggling <laughs> to liberate africa don't don't thank forget you. your local team in biafra and don't forget Absolutely. Your... football club is my is my my first love um, and Liverpool is the sidekick. My, 
my first team in Uganda is Vira Football Club. Vira, then my team in Kenya is AFC Leopard. Then my team in the world is Barcelona. Wonderful. I die with the, I die with the people of Cantona. I like Cantona. And I, you can now guess why I like Biafra. <laughs> yes. Yes, of course. So I, thank you very I much. Do. Thank you thank very you much. For having me. Thank, thank you. you very much, Honorable thank you. His Excellency Namdi Kanu, the leader of indigenous people of Biafra. I want to take this opportunity to thank you and to tell you that my television station is linked, will be linked directly to every system of the Biafran people, everywhere. Thank you very much. We shall, let's today make a formidable move. I am not here for Thank money. You. I never asked for a penny from any Nigerian in order to broadcast. I started broadcasting with passion. I have already told you one of my daughters is married to a man from Onita. And this man comes to my house, tells me the story. You know, in London, he tells me the story. I have been a supporter of the people. That Obasanjo there, you see walking yes. free. It was me demonstrating at the Nigerian embassy for Abacha to release him with Chief Abiola. Yes. I was, I wanted them released together with Osuji who is the president of ICC. We used to come yes. there every Friday for Obasanjo to have freedom. But when Obasanjo came out, he looks for money. Anywhere you find Obasanjo, you know he's looking for money. I'm sorry to tell <laughs> Nigerians, may God bless me for being truthful and honest. Is there's, there's no is conflict. There? Is... There's no conflict Obasanjo has ever solved in Africa. Even when no. we, yes, even when we went for Zimbabwe oh. Troika in Melbourne House, Obasanjo sided with Australia to expel Zimbabwe from the Commonwealth. That's the man you have. But thank you very much, yes. God. Jesus Christ, hold us. Don't, don't tire. Keep on the struggle. Keep fighting. I will. Keep thank democratically. You, sending the message you need a referendum peaceful ways don't give up may god hold your hand thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you for having me thank you very much yes viewers this station therefore is for africa by africa with africa long live africa Charles.